All right, welcome everybody. So this is um, a webinar today. Really, we're calling this Nonprofit Accounting 101. Uh, you know, the real goal for us is to really, for everyone who's on this call, uh, whether you're a board member, an executive director, or um, accounting staff, uh, or even program staff to really be able to learn sort of the nuts and bolts of what goes into a good accounting system and how you can use that system uh, to make better financial decisions which ultimately you know helps you uh, and all of us in what you are doing out there. Um, so real quick, uh, the basic flow is I'm going to do a real quick intro and then we'll get into the meat of it. Um, we'll wrap up with the Q&A session. I think I probably will be able to talk here for about, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes and then hopefully we'll have, you know, um, 10, 15 minutes of Q&A, and we can obviously go past that if people have more detailed questions. So our, who is Easy Office? Who am I? Um, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Easy Office, and our goal in life, our mission, is to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of nonprofit organizations. You know, one of our slogans, one of our philosophies, is to do what you do best. And uh, my wife will tell you that, I would not be a good camp counselor, but um, we're actually decent at accounting. And so the idea is that uh, together, if we're all focusing on what we do best, um, the sector as a whole is better off and we're, we're all going to be able to accomplish much more. Uh, the other thing is we do finance and accounting services. This is something that we specialize in and have expertise in. Our, our slogan there is to be audit ready because we think no matter what size your organization, even if you're not required to do an audit, um, or if you're a large organization, we want you to be audit ready throughout the throughout the weeks, throughout the month, throughout the quarters, so that you're always um, looking at accurate and good financial information. We were founded by a team of Yale MBAs and CPAs. Um, we were founded expressly to assist nonprofits, so we work exclusively with nonprofits. Um, I'm a former executive director, so I know. Uh, a lot about uh, what it's like to be um, running a nonprofit, uh, resource constrained, obvious, uh, oftentimes, and also just to be pulled in a bunch of different directions. So I have a lot of um, sympathy for that. We currently have about 150 nonprofits that we serve in 26 different states, uh, with about 30 on our accounting staff. Why do we care about nonprofits? Why? Why do? Um, is this an important issue for all of us? One is there's really a lot of room for improvement in the sector. You know, an, an audit by Indiana University found over 50% of nonprofits don't actually follow GAAP. And so, you know, GAAP is the general guidelines and rules for accounting standards in the U.S., and their audit found that over half weren't actually following those guidelines. 20% uh, actually reported implausible or sometimes impossible numbers on their 990. Um, in those cases, they found that about half of those actually made the organization or the nonprofit look worse. So the numbers, if they had actually followed GAAP, the numbers would have been more accurate, would have looked better. So what, what this suggests, and which I, I think experience for me really proves true, is this is not malfeasance, people aren't cooking the books, but it's just simply a lack of expertise and understanding Uh, we always laugh that you know few CPAs become executive directors and vice versa, and there's a reason for that. Um, you know, sort of like me in the camp counselor example. Most executive directors are really wearing a whole bunch of different hats, pulled in a bunch of different directions. You're managing the board, you're managing your staff, you're uh, cause oriented, so you're you know you get engaged in your programs. So there's just a whole lot of stuff going on. And one of the things with nonprofits is you really need access to a wide range of skills and expertise. And that's typically hard to find in any one single person. Um, nonprofits in general, you know, I think 98% are under $3 million, uh, their budget. And so that just 
suggest that it's difficult to have uh, you know, a broad range of skills and talent in any single organization. Another thing that's sort of unfortunate, and I'll only touch on this, uh, but it is an important area for nonprofits to consider, is that nonprofit organizations are actually disproportionately impacted by fraud. So a study by Harvard showed that in nonprofit organizations with less than 100 employees, so you know, the vast majority of nonprofits have less than 100 employees, their average fraud size was $98,000, so about 100 grand. And then for groups that are over 100 employees, so much larger, much more, a lot more money flowing around, a lot more resources, when they caught fraud, it also was around 100 grand. And so your smaller organizations often are lacking the controls or just specifically lacking the expertise to really track that. Um, internal and external audits. Uh, only catch things about you know one out of six times, and the um, two thirds of the fraud is actually caught through proper controls. So when you come in and you actually do a check, you know you bring in an auditor or something, you may or may not catch it. But the vast majority of fraud gets caught by just having you know good old fashioned checks and balances. And we did have one question. Someone asked if this would be available later. Uh, we are going to record this and put it on our, our blog. So the rest of today, we're going to sort of walk through this financial accountability um, metric. The thing, our philosophy is to have a good accounting department, there's really three pieces to it. You need to build uh, a good system. You then need to run that system consistently. And the reporting and everything should just sort of fall out of it. Um, and so really having that strong infrastructure helps you achieve your mission. So we're going to go through the build piece of it first. So the fundamental building block, the fundamental thing that is uh, important in your accounting system and tracking uh, what, how to reflect the activities of your organization really comes down to your chart of accounts. So yeah, you're going to want to use an accounting system such as QuickBooks, Peachtree, FundEasy, NetSuite. Um, Oracle, uh, Blackbots, Financial Edge, there's a, a bunch of different systems out there and they're all going to have a chart of accounts. And it's really, like I said, it's the building block of the whole system. One thing I really want to point out, and this is, this is extremely true, there's a big difference between a for-profit chart of accounts and a non-profit chart of accounts. So a lot of non-profits that we run across, they, their treasurer, maybe even as a, you know, as a corporate controller or really knows for-profit accounting. Um, but nonprofit accounting is all of that with another whole layer of complexity wrapped around it. And so there's a really big difference. So when you're setting up this building block, it's really important that um, when you're doing that, and if you're doing it with your treasurer or you're doing it yourself, that you really understand um, the nonprofit implications. Um, about, I don't know, about six or seven years ago, Indiana University um, came out with a unified chart of accounts. And the idea was that this was a chart of accounts that could work across the nonprofit sector, um, and it's just sort of a uh, a nice structure to begin bringing some sort of consistency into the nonprofit sector. And, and this is a really good place to start when you're designing your own chart of accounts, or when you're thinking about tweaking or changing your chart of accounts. Um, the uh, and here's the the web link for it. If you just Google uh, UCOA or National Center for Charitable Statistics, you'll be able to find that. Or you can send me a note afterwards, and I, I can definitely point, this, point, it, point you in the right direction. Um, but so really, the chart of accounts is broken into you know, uh, several different areas. The things that go into the statement of financial position, or in the for-profit world, is known as the balance sheet. Those are your assets, your liabilities, and your net assets. Um, net assets is sort of, again, a nonprofit term for equity. You know, it's what's left over after your assets and liabilities. So you can see a screenshot over here on the right. This is just an Excel. And you can see how it's sort of, um, there's parent accounts and then these sub accounts. And so it has a nice accordion structure. So you can collapse it or blow it out uh, if you need more detail. So, you know, the collapsed version may be important for a board meeting and the detailed version may be important for, um, you know, staff as they look through it. 
For the statement of activities, which is like your profit and loss statement, this is the thing that most nonprofits are most interested in. Um, you know, it goes through your contributed support, so donations, grants, your earned revenues, um, and then on down the line. And then you know, the seven, the seven hundred, seven thousand category is personnel-related expenses, which make up about seventy-five percent of nonprofits' budgets. And then there's non-personnel-related, so uh, supplies, office expenses, that sort of thing. So the one downside of UCOA is. It's designed whether you're the American Museum of Natural History or you are, uh, you know, a soup kitchen in Tulsa or you are a, um, you know, Boy Scout troop in um, Wyoming. It, it's really designed to sort of be a catch-all, but the problem is for the vast majority of nonprofits, I always say, that, you know, it's like killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer. It's really overkill. It's 800 lines long, and it's way too complex, way too much for any um, any one thing. So the nice thing is. You know, you probably want to eliminate a lot of the line items that are in that chart of accounts um, to really simplify it. The other mistake, so this is sort of QuickBooks terminology, but the ability to use the class, like in QuickBooks to have classes, the idea is that on any single transaction, you mark it in, with the, within the chart of accounts, but then you mark it with a second attribute, which is whether it's a program expense or an admin expense. Um, we often see groups who try to sort of put that into the chart of accounts, so where the program, the admin, and the fundraising. So in the chart of accounts, you might say program office supplies, admin office supplies, and fundraising office supplies. And we really think that's not the best way to go. It can get pretty um, difficult to manage pretty quickly. So that's something to watch out for. So that's really the chart of accounts. I breeze through that pretty quickly, but the important message there is you know, if you're going to spend some time and energy, if you build it correctly right at the core, all the reporting and everything should fall out of it. A lot of people spend a lot of time in Excel manipulating reports, moving stuff around, reformatting it, um, and your reporting really should be as close to as click of a button as possible. And if it is, that means that you've built it correctly up front. The second half of building it correctly is your budget. Um, and this is something that stresses everybody out, including myself. Um, but knowing that, uh, you know, sitting down and planning out what's going to happen over the next three months and over the next year, we think is really important regardless of the size of your organization. It's important for you as a family. Um, it's the same thing if you have a $50,000 organization. Um, and even more important as you get larger. So one thing it does is establishes credibility. So when you go out to funders and they say, well, what are we going to fund? And you can, you know, whip your budget out of your back project, uh, pocket and say, here's what we're doing. So it really builds a lot of credibility. Um, it sets expectations for both you, your staff, and your donors. Provides a measurement tool. So every month, every three months, every six months, you can say, you know, when we sat down and dreamed about what we were going to do, what we were going to accomplish as an organization, you know, were we able to do that? Um, it obviously doesn't measure the impact, the social impact of the organization, but it does help you know where and how you're spending your money and where you are. Um, are you on track for that? Are you going to run out of money? Or are you not going to run out of money? Um, one of the big things, unfortunately, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it in our sector, is there's an emphasis on programs versus fundraising versus admin. So there's a lot of donors out there who really harp on and focus on that fundraising admin ratio. And that, that's a you know another two-hour discussion for another day on whether that's good or bad. But the reality is it's there and it exists. And so when you're doing your accounting, it's really important to be able to have that number at the tip of your tongue and to be able to report on that um, and manage to that uh, as well. The other thing that budgets do is it really helps you um, manage your cash because if you get something unexpected comes up then you know how to sort of deal with it in the future. So creating a budget. There are five five big areas in creating a budget. Um, you know, for, If you're an organization of less than five million really just focusing on the revenue and expenses um, that, that's going to be the primary focus. That's going to be where you're going to spend the vast majority of your time budgeting. 
one of the things that we often see is there's a difference between your dreams and what's reasonable. And so uh, I think the nonprofit sector in general is a very uh, optimistic group of people and we're all very passionate about what we're doing and we're always dreaming and hoping that everyone else around us, you know, uh, falls in line with that. But if you have a five-year history of growing 10% a year, um, unless there's a really good reason, don't budget to double, right? So set reasonable targets. And, and that's something that your board can really help with. And that's a, that's a um, reasonable board expectations really help you think through that. Make sure that you have separate budgets for program admin and fundraising. Um, a budget on a, you know, the vast majority of groups budget on a monthly basis. That's generally our recommendation. Some exceptions to that are, uh, you know, nonprofits with say under two hundred thousand dollars in expenses, and maybe you're a local theater, and you do uh, shows in the spring and in the fall. Um, so monthly is not going to really make a lot of sense. It's not how your money flows around, and it's sort of overkill. But in general, we like to go monthly. Um, and then the other thing is just making sure you have a really good Excel model. The, the uh, you know, Excel is sort of dangerous because you can kind of manipulate it from time to time. But just being able to draft out different scenarios and saying, well, what if I hire two more staff? Or what if one of my staff leaves? What does that do to us? Uh, so you can sort of model different scenarios. But the other thing, the other thing I'm, I'll just emphasize here on the program fundraising and admin. Um, it, this is also required information on the IRS Form 990. That's an annual form you have to file at the end of each year, regardless of size. If you're less than 50000 you don't, but above that, you do. Um, there's a, something called a 990N if you're below 50000 But the uh, So not only is this important for funders, not only is this important for you to be able to manage your business, but it's also required information for the 990. So if you are not tracking this today, this is certainly something you should um, build into your, uh, your tracking system. One of the nice things about the monthly uh, versus quarterly is nonprofits, uh, which are typically pressed for cash, right? We're all sort of constrained on resources. And so when you're doing it monthly, it really forces you to stay on top of things when you're budgeting monthly and you're looking at that on a monthly basis. Um, but it, you, you can really get overkill. It does not have to be that difficult. Um, you know, for most items, your rent, your energy bill, your uh, you know, your telephone, cell phone bills, whatever it is, most things you can just divide by 12. If you know, you know, you've got a summer camp and for three months expenses are going to double, then those are the major program expenses that you sort of need to budget, truly think through on a month basis. But most stuff, most executive director salary, it's probably not going to radically change throughout the year. So on those, just divide by 12 and keep moving. So that's really the build piece. Again, so just to reiterate, when you build that budget correctly and you build the fundamental um, chart of accounts correctly, once those things are built, uh, the running part of it, the monthly bookkeeping, the monthly accounting, the monthly financial statements, all of that just needs to be done consistently. Okay, so I have a, a question here. I just want to answer it before I get, get away from it. The question is, um, why do you not advise using a range of classes such as program supplies, admin supplies, fundraising supplies? Um, isn't it easier to see, to run a report on, to see how much you spent on supplies for fundraising? So uh, that, that's actually exactly our, the idea is that, you know, the way I think of it is your chart of accounts runs down the left side of the page and your classes run across the top top part of the page. And so you want to, in your chart of accounts, I want to know everything I spent on supplies. So my total column just tells me everything I spent on supplies. But then each of the different columns sort of breaks that down by program, by admin, and fundraising. Um, so that's both useful from a financial reporting standpoint, and that's also how 
we advise setting up your budget? So hopefully that answers the question. If not, I will we'll jump back into that um, during the Q&A session at the end. That's an important question. So the next part of it, you know, the building it really should be a one-time event. Um, you probably want to review it every two or three years to make sure it's fresh, to make sure it's updated, to make sure um, you know it's getting you the information that you need. But the real bulk of the work in accounting is really this bookkeeping piece and making sure you have accurate data. So once you build that infrastructure, you have to manage it. And one of the things that we frequently see is your reports are really only as good as your data entry. So if you have garbage in, you're going to get garbage out, right? So if the, the transactional accounting is not done properly, um, then it's going to be very difficult to have any confidence in the reports that fall out of the system. One of the things that we frequently see when we take over accounts is, you know, within the accounting, you can actually just see we know how they've had three different bookkeepers. So there'll be in a, a chart of a line in the chart of accounts is going to have transactions, and then all of a sudden it goes six months without any transactions, and that's when the new bookkeeper came in and started treating treating those transactions differently. And so that's a real challenge that nonprofits face um, is just that sort of constant turnover. And so keeping the probably the most important thing in running your books is consistency, and um, when you have that constant turnover, it just creates a lot of issues around really having that consistency and having uh, both consistency in how it's done, but also an understanding of how you built that fundamental structure to make sure that it, everything is lined up. So again, you know, kind of to state the obvious, the key to useful financial statements is accurate and reliable data. So, you know, if you're sitting around the board room and, and no one believes the numbers, um, it's not going to be a great discussion, right? So you got to have a lot of confidence in those numbers. So when you're when you're setting up bookkeeping, there's really three different areas. There's people, there's the processes and procedures and policies that you follow, and then there's the actual technology. And so from a people standpoint, there's really several different options on how you get this done, right? So one, you know, obviously a very common way is you actually hire you have in-house staff who actually do the bookkeeping. Um, the other area is some small organizations, you know, the treasurer is actually doing the bookkeeping. Um, the other way you can you can have it is there, there are a lot of freelancers. So people who work on 10, 15, 10, 15 different clients, and they are typically local people um, who work you know, just are working independently and they'll do five hours here, five hours there, ten hours here. Um, there's obviously organizations like us that are, um, you know, sort of we provide services, you know, using a team-based structure. Um, and then also sometimes CPA firms will do this. They tend to be the most expensive, um, but that is, that's also a way that people get this done. There's pros and cons of all the different uh, systems, you know. Um, there's cost concerns. Obviously, volunteers are, you know, great as far as cost goes, but there's a lot of concerns then around controls and consistency. Um, so that's sort of a trade-off you have to think through when you're deciding like how you want to achieve this. Um, but those, that's the general ways that the four general ways that organizations deal um, find, you know, the humans to do this work. Um, the next thing, I call it financial systems. I'm not meaning technology here. I'm meaning more of the processes, policies, and procedures. So example is timesheets. So how are you tracking timesheets in your organization? Are you using sheets of paper? Are they being properly approved and signed off? Um, how is that information stored? Um, are you using web-based tools? There's a lot of amazing web-based tools out there for everything from time tracking to accounts payable approvals to online bill pay. So the, the thing around the, the financial system is you really want to, one, again, back to the consistency message, as much as you can be consistent, um, your life's going to be a lot smoother, a lot easier. The other thing is really make sure that there's appropriate checks and balances. Um, again, back to the very early comments around fraud, really knowing and understanding um, 
what those checks and balances should be. So if you have specific questions around it, the general rule is um, anything that you can have, if one person has the ability to move money, so whether to deposit money, to pay money, to send out payroll, you want a separate person reconciling that. So that, you know, just as a fundamental, the bare minimum is always have a check whenever money is floating around. And then the last thing is technology. Um, I've got a slide in the back around technology, um, and we, we work with about 10 or 15 different systems. You know, the, the thing that we come back to is 90% of nonprofits use QuickBooks, um, and it meets 95% of their needs. So if you're an organization, you're under, you know, you're one or two million or less, QuickBooks, vast majority, you're going to be able to, to use that. Some hardcore accountants don't like it because it gives you so much flexibility. It sort of gives you enough rope to get in trouble or enough rope to hang yourself. The um, If you have consistent policies and procedures and if you have consistent bookkeeping, that's not an issue. Um, but it's by far the most, I think, affordable and valuable. There's definitely things higher up the food chain, such as NetSuite, um, which are a bit more expensive but you get way more for, for that. And so as your organization grows, you know, I, sort of the $3 million threshold, as you go past that, um, we advise at that point you want to probably take a deeper look and look at maybe some different technology. So the last thing here, so we're about 30 minutes in. I'm going to spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes talking through financial reporting. We're also having an entire hour-long webinar in December where we're going to go through financial reporting in great detail going to be a little more hands-on talking about how to actually read and interpret these statements. Um, for now, I'm just going to give an overview of these are the types of statements you need to be looking at. These are the types of things that you need to think through. And these are the types of reports that your financial system and your ongoing bookkeeping should be able to produce. So if you're not able to produce these things, you know, I encourage you to go back, look at your chart of accounts, or to look at the actual bookkeeping policies and procedures and how you're doing it. Um, I really encourage people to, to, no matter how small you are, to complete reporting on a monthly basis. It does a couple of things. One is it's forcing everyone to look at it on a monthly basis. So the executive director should really be able to understand this and make sense of it. The second thing that it does is, you know, from time to time there are bookkeeping errors. You know, uh, it, it's like a typo. You know, someone puts in a bill wrong. So when you're looking at it on a monthly basis, you're looking at it in March, those things will pop out to you and you'll go, oh, you know what? Um, this this got missed for February. But if you're looking at stuff that's three months old, six months old, I mean, I have a hard time remembering what happened last week, much less what happened six months ago. So I really think reporting has to be completed on a monthly basis. And then for the board, most groups, you, you know, um, provide summary level reporting on a quarterly basis. It depends on your size. We've got some larger groups that have, you know, very complex board reporting on a monthly basis, which is great if your board is that involved. But generally, for the vast majority of nonprofits, we think um, it's quarterly, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, there's, around the reporting, and this goes back to bookkeeping as well, there's really two primary accounting methods. There's cash accounting and there's accrual accounting. Um, for the absolute vast majority of nonprofits, we suggest accrual accounting. Um, the cash accounting is just, it, it's more like your home finances. It's, you know, money in, money out, how much money is left, can I go out to dinner this weekend? Um, accrual accounting, it, it gives a much more accurate picture of your organization. Um, and it's generally uh, our, our suggestion. I will say that for, for most of our clients, we use what we call a modified accrual um, accounting method, which is for large items, we're a full-blown accrual. We're really taking care of making sure the expense and the income hit in the right period. But for smaller expenses, you know, the bookkeeping effort is, um, is too much or is too expensive to really see any benefit. So um, this is again, you know, this is kind of a larger discussion uh, around what's accrual and what's cash. You know, basically uh, accrual means 
the income or the expense is, is not necessarily tied to the cash flow, and, and that's the fundamental difference. Um, and this is something that you know uh, organizations really should be aware of and sort of understand. Um, and in our webinar in December, we'll go into this in a little more detail, uh, to, so so people can sort of see the difference. Um, you know, one example is, so if someone makes a pledge and says, "I'm going to give you a hundred dollars," then you book that um, revenue. Uh, however, they may not pay you that hundred dollars until three months later, and when the cash comes in, you receive the cash but you actually book the revenue when you receive that pledge. Um, and there's more to that example, but that's the basic difference. Um, another example is a vendor comes in and provides services for you in September. They come in and they wash all your windows, but they don't send you the invoice until October or November. The expense should hit, should hit your books in September when the work is performed, not necessarily when you got the invoice. So that's a couple of examples of how that works. And it impacts your reports. So there's really these, these are just some core reports, um, some core reports here on, that need to be produced on a monthly basis. The uh, statement of financial position, which is the balance sheet, if you will, it shows you how much cash you have, it shows you how much money you're due, you know, what your accounts receivable, how much money is coming in, how much money is due to be going out. Um, your statement of activities is, you know, your profit and loss, to use the for-profit term, but it's how much money came in, what are your, what's your revenue, and what sort of expenses are on the way out the door. So that's the one that people spend probably 80% of their time on. Um, a budget versus actual. So again, once you've set that budget up in the build phase, if you've got a good budget, you can compare that to what actually happened. And that does a couple things. One is it, it helps you monitor what's really going on in the organization. And then two, if there is a bookkeeping error, it really shows up because you're going, I only budgeted $1,000 for the phones. You know, why is there a $6,000 phone expense? So either that's a mistake or something I need to really look into um, a lot more to figure out what's going on. Somebody's going crazy with their Verizon bill. Um, and the statement of functional expenses, this is just, uh, you know, breaking out how much are we spending on program A, program B, program C, um, and really looking at um, your activity on a program-by-program program basis. Um, the other one that's not in there, uh, which which uh, is a lot of organizations look at, but not all, is a cash flow. Um, there's two types of cash flow. There's one that's looking at historical cash flow, um, and then there's a forward-looking sort of forecast or projection of cash flow, which almost tends to be the more important one, and I'll, I'll touch on that more in a little bit. But yeah, with, with accrual accounting, you really do want to pay attention to um, – uh, your cash flow because if you get all those pledges that come in and you're like, oh, I got $10,000, but if they're pledges and not actually cash, you know, that's important to figure out before you go spend the money. Um, one last thing is the fund balance report. So this is a report that shows you, particularly for people out there who have grants, reimbursable grants, um, and a lot of restricted funding. Or even if you put the restrictions on yourself, you say, I'm going to have this event, and all the money we raise today is going to go towards, you know, the kids in, um, in Thailand. So that fund balance report shows you exactly how, how much is in the fund as of, you know, today, how much money we've spent on it this year, how much money has gone out the door, and that, that gives you a snapshot of, I have this much more to spend in this category or I need to raise this much more money to sort of cover this category. So it's a very helpful report, and um, one that can be created, with a, even in QuickBooks, uh, can be created at a click of a button. One thing I'll say here on the budget versus actuals is um, this last item. So really, one of the things, if, if you have 
an item in your budget, but there's no actuals, that tells you one of two things, uh, and vice versa. If you have an item with no budget, but a whole bunch of actuals, either one, there's a bookkeeping issue that you sort of need to figure out the root cause of. You know, when you budgeted it, you put it in line 7,200, but the bookkeeper is putting it in line 7,250, so they're not matching up. So that's something you have to go back and sort of figure out the root cause of it. Um, or, you know, you've changed as an organization. You've, you've added a program or you, you've steered it in a different direction, and uh, you just need to be aware of that and to recognize the implications um, overall to your organization. Statement of functional expenses, again, this is the program admin and fundraising. I've, I've touched on this, so I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, it, it is something that's important in, for a lot of funders, uh, for good or bad, and that's something that you really want. You want your books to be able to produce for you when you need it. You know, maybe you don't want to look at it on a monthly basis, um, or maybe you do. That's kind of up to you. Yeah, that we we frequently get a ton of questions around. Hey, does this count? Can I count this towards programs? Can I count this towards fundraising? Can I count this? You know, does this have to be counted towards admin? So the the guidelines on this uh, for GAP, there's somewhat there. Um, it's definitely an area where you want someone to help you think through. But basically, you need to pick a methodology. And the rules say there's three, you know, it needs to be documented, so you need to have it written down. It needs to be reasonable, and again, back to my word of the day, it needs to be consistent. So if you've got a policy that's documented, reasonable, and consistent, um, you're, you know, you're halfway there. The, there are certain rules around, so say you send out a newsletter. If that newsletter is soliciting funding, soliciting money saying, hey, please give money, then that's a fundraising expense. And if you send out a newsletter and half of it you want to classify it as advocacy or education, um, and then at the end of it you ask for money, the IRS rules are such that that has to all go towards fundraising. But if you send out a newsletter, you don't ask for money, and the whole thing is saying, you know, support our children's schools, come to this, you know, educational seminar, on how to raise better children, then that can be a program expense. Um, so there are very specific rules, particularly around fundraising, um, that you need to be aware of. The most popular way to allocate expenses is just based on employees' time. So that's kind of the most common. Um, you can also allocate it based on square footage. Uh, you can you can allocate it based on um, your budgets for the year. Uh, it, again, if it's documented, reasonable, and consistent, you know, reasonable being a keyword, um, you can do that. Um, typically, we like to get those allocations approved by both the executive director, sometimes the board, um, and then if you do have an auditor, it's always smart to just kind of run it by the auditor and say, hey, are you guys okay with this methodology? Because that's what they're going to be checking at the end of the year. And there's a lot of other things besides just salaries that can be allocated. Um, you can allocate your rent. So if you've got an office and half of it's used for training of refugees and half of it's used for, you know, your administrative staff, then you can split that out across program and admin. You know, office space your, um, does not have to just be overhead, right, because you're actually using it to, to deliver your programs. So really you can go through your whole chart of accounts and kind of think through what of this has to be in one spot or the other. There are certain expenses um, that, again, the IRS is, you know, strict on us around fundraising, um, board meetings. You know, you can't say a board meeting is a program expense. That has to always be uh, administrative. So there, there are a few little exceptions, but as a general rule, you know, document it, make sure it's reasonable and consistent, and then if you do have an order, get them to sign off on it. And here's what an end result could look like. This could be your quarterly report um, showing your admin programs, fundraising, and what those percentages are. And this is just a summary. And you can see over here the chart of accounts at 7,500, 8,100. So again, that's a collapsed version that shows, um, sorry, that's a collapsed version that shows uh, those examples.
So the statement of financial position, which again is the balance sheet, um, there's three three types of net assets, which is you know what what does the organization actually have or own. There's unrestricted funds, which we all love. There's temporarily restricted funds, and those are funds that are either restricted in purpose or restricted in time. So there's those are the two types of restrictions. So it's restricted in purpose means um, you have to use this money for um, the refugees from Somalia. And you're restricted in time, an example is someone comes to you in September and says, I want to support next April's um, you know, reading mobile program. So I only want it to be used, only want this money to be used in April. So that would be a time restriction. Permanently restricted is for endowments. So if you have an endowment, um, you know all about permanently restricted. And if you don't have an endowment, uh, you don't have to worry about it. The uh, part of the, a big part of the statement of financial position is around the grant tracking, um, and that that kind of goes back to the fund balance report, knowing exactly what's left in your grants at any point in time. Um, have you really recouped all that you could? Um, and there's really two forms of grant tracking. You know, we track over $100 million worth of grants, and there's really not a type of grant we haven't seen. But really, there's either grants where the revenue comes first or the expenses come first, which are called reimbursable grants. And how you set that up in your accounting system, how you track it, really kind of comes down to those, those couple of things, yeah, to, to just boil it down to its most basic um, setup. And so it really varies you know, by the accounting system that you use. Um, your ultimate goal is to be able to run a statement of financial position for each and every grant so you know exactly where it is. And the vast majority of accounting systems, even QuickBooks, you can do this as long as you have the discipline and consistency to set it up correctly. So I'll, I'll say a few notes about presentation. Um, and then we'll get, I'm seeing a bunch of questions pop in, so I'm gonna I'll get to those here in about 10 minutes. The um, when you are presenting to your board or your funders, one of the things is if your board is anything like my board or my wife's nonprofit's board, you know, there's short attention spans, right? And so the key is to really spend some time to give them an executive summary, um, really summarize the information as much as possible, and all of the detail the 10 pages of reports that you know and, and work with, just kind of keep those on hand as questions are presented. One of the things I've found, particularly with boards, is the more information you give them, the more they're going to get down in the weeds and the more questions they're going to ask. And I really firmly believe that the role of a board is one of governance and general direction and oversight. So you kind of don't want them, I think there was a book called, you know, um, what color should the brochure be, and other favorite board discussions. So you really don't want your board thinking about that kind of stuff, right? You want them looking at what are your overall revenue trends, what are your overall um, summary numbers. We really, we really work hard to make sure that information is out to boards at least a week before their meeting so that they have time to review it. Uh, so then actually in your board meeting, they're asking more intelligent questions and informed questions. And then lastly, you know, the more you can prepare, the more time you have, the more you can understand those numbers, you're going to feel more confident when you go into that board meeting. Um, on this, the, the you know, there's a lot of just general presentation tips around simplicity, using graphs and pictures. But the last thing I'll say is it, nonprofit accounting, again, I've said it several times, it's very different from for-profit accounting. So you may have leaders in the, the business community on your board bankers, uh, you're still really going to have to educate your board and translate for them. So if you go in and talk about a statement of financial position, vast majority, even accounting savvy people are going to not ex instinctively know what that is. But if you say a balance sheet, you know, anybody who knows accounting is going to sort of know what that is. So, you know, when we're talking about permanent restrictions and temporary restrictions, those are all things that are um, not intuitive uh, to even you know your most business savvy person on your board, so you really have to work hard to sort of educate them and inform them about what they're looking at. 
And here's an example of a couple of charts uh, that you could you could show to your board, um, you know, at, at the summary level. Um, final thoughts on this: uh, strong financial management is really essential to the success of any organization. I know that sometimes money, it's sort of you know we don't want to talk about it, right? Because we're we're social sector, we're doing good in the world, we're trying to improve the lives of others. So money is you know Wall Street can sort of feel dirty. But it is an important thing for any organization. It's important for your personal life. It's important for your family. It's just as important for the nonprofit that, that, that you love. It's really important to try to engage finance members on your board. If you can get a really good treasurer um, who is helping you, who is maybe reviewing the, the financials with you on a monthly basis, one of the things I always encourage people is don't use your board members to create the information but use your board members to help you interpret it and make decisions. All of us have different gifts and skills. You know, it's back to our kind of do what you do best philosophy. Um, but at a minimum, it, it, if you can understand what's in this slide deck, if you can understand the basic tenets of it, you are leap years ahead of most people in the nonprofit sector in sort of understanding um, this information and, and being able to make sense of it. So, and then build, run, report equals financial success. So, a few things um, on, I want to close out just very quickly to, to let you know a little bit about us. I'm going to spend three minutes on this, and then I'm going to jump into the questions. And I'm going to try to unmute folks um, so that we can, we can capture the Q&A uh, verbally as well. All right, so um, I've mentioned this. We're 100% we're focused on nonprofits, uh, which I think uh, really helps us. We've learned a lot over the last five years of doing this, um, and we're really trying to bring that out to the sector and saying, hey, guys, this is a way that all of us can get better. Um, we do use a team-based solution, and we are off-site. So I'm in Boise, Idaho right now. We've got clients in 26 different states. Um, the team-based solution is really nice because it solves that sort of lonely bookkeeper problem. Uh, in that, you know, we're all sitting out here um, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. We're constantly asking questions of each other. We're saying, hey, when you get that reimbursable grant for that client, can you come over here and show me, remind me again how you did that? So the team-based solution, there's a lot of shared expertise that happens. Um, there's also improved internal controls because we're splitting the work among a bunch of different people. And then also it really reduces the impact of turnover. Um, because no matter how small of a client we get, we cross-train three or four people on it, so that people and we create client-specific procedures, so that people can sort of um, uh, step in as seamlessly as possible. So you know, the question to ask yourself when you're building uh, your accounting structure is your chart of account accounts and is your accounting system properly configured? Is it giving you the reports that you want? Um, so make sure that you're in alignment with accounting best practices. This is something that we do with all of our clients when they come on board, but it's something that you can also, if you have experts around you, you can work with on your own. Are your books being run consistently? And are they being run correctly? Um, this is 90% of what Easy Office does is the running piece of it. Um, and that, but it's obviously a, a lot of groups do it, do it themselves or use a CPA firm. The key there is to really have good solid procedures um, and to really uh, make sure you're understanding the, that area of it. And then you know in reporting we say one of the things is do you really know how to use the information you have? Because it's not just um, building the information. My goal for the nonprofit sector is that first and foremost everyone knows how to use information. I don't necessarily think all 1.5 uh, you know million nonprofit organizations and the uh, you know, 45 million people that work there need to know how to create the financial information, but I do think they need to know how to read it and interpret it and use it. Um, we, are, we have a very flexible solution. There, we have a little calculator on our website that you can go, you hop on our website, you can find this calculator. The, um, it, it allows you to either just say, I want Easy Office to do everything. Here's the total scope of what I want you guys to do. Or you can sort of divide it up and say, I want you guys to do payroll and bank recs, but we're going to do all the donation processing. So you can, we can sort of work with you. We can mix and match the scope to fit your budget. 
We work with a bunch of different accounting systems. Um, you can see them on here, NetSuite, Oracle, QuickBooks. So the key for us is just online access. Um, if you do use QuickBooks, we pay all the fees for that. Here's a whole bunch of our clients. Um, like I said, it's about 160, <coughs> excuse me, about 160 clients around the country um, in you know, New York, DC, California, and kind of everywhere in between. So the last thing we'll do is, is answer questions. Um, Susan Lentini is on the line as well. She is our Director of Client Services. She is in New York City. And I have here with me presenting um, is Mary Leeton. She's our Director of Accounting Services. She's a CPA with about 20 years of nonprofit accounting experience. So if any of you guys ask me any difficult questions, I'm going to defer to her. Um, but with that, first thing I want to do is answer the questions that have already come in. And let me see if I can pull these out. Uh, I'll run through these, and then I'm going to unmute it so that everyone can start asking questions. All right. Um, if, if the current current chart of accounts does not mirror the UCOA with regard to the number groups, should we change those numbers? Um, you know, uh, that's a good question. It is certainly worth doing. We find that if you have numbers in your chart of accounts, it really speeds up the bookkeeping. Um, like we know that 7120 across, you know, 95% of our clients is payroll. And so our payroll taxes for non-management staff. So having a really consistent numbering system is nice. UCOA does map to like the United Way's grant standards and some of those things. So that is a, uh, that's probably not a bad idea. Um, yeah, so here, here's a great question. Um, for a very small organization of less than 100,000 a year, is it acceptable to budget some classes on a non-aggregate basis? So just dump everything into travel and meetings instead of breaking it out by transportation, meals, lodging, et cetera. So as a general rule, I think that's absolutely a great idea. One of the weird things, though, is the IRS 990 has some very specific categories for whatever reason. Um, the IRS decided to do that. So in some cases, you can lump things together. But in some cases, to really accurately prepare your 990, you need the detail. So as a general rule, it's easier at a transaction level to record it on a detailed basis and then have it roll up into the aggregate. Um, because if it's in the aggregate and then a funder or a 990 sort of requires you to split it out, that's going to be a bunch of work later on. So, so the answer to that question is, is it, it depends. In general, you don't want to go overboard with a bunch of ridiculous detail. But there are some things with funders and 990s where you, where you do require detail. Um, a bunch of questions around uh, will this uh, presentation be available online and the webinar. We are recording this. And so all of this is going to get posted on our blog, which you can find at youreasyoffice.com. Um, Okay, so I think that I think that's the end of the questions. Uh, there were a bunch of questions about will this be available. Um, we are also it's very likely we work with a lot of different uh, referral partners and state associations around the country that will be offering this and other webinars um, on their schedule as well. We will probably do this one again in the spring, um, but we're happy to do this if you want us to do this for you or for your board or for a group of people. Um, we're happy to do this as much as, as people like, but it will be on our um, on our uh, on our blog. All right, with that, it is it is 4:58 on the East Coast. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can you can raise your hand. I'm just going to start unmuting everybody, so that if you have questions, you know, chime in. Um, as I'm doing that, Susan, I don't know if you want to add in uh, your two cents here while I. Uh, open up the lines. All right. 
So any any uh, any further questions? questions? All right. It doesn't sound like there's any further questions. If you do have them, let me know. Can you email oh. um, the info about the one you mentioned in December? Oh yeah, you bet. So in the um, this may have been forwarded to you. Jeff, I think while you're, you're talking, if you can mute. Okay, I'll mute everybody. I see. I see why they call us to mute because it's uh, noisy. All right, I've muted everybody. Um, yeah, so the webinar, and most of you probably received an email and it had three different webinars listed. Some of you may have just heard about this one, um, but there are two more webinars coming up. We'll send out reminders. We'll send out reminder emails to our, you know, to our newsletter list. So if you want to learn more about that, shoot me an email or Susan an email. You've got our email addresses here on the um, on the screen, or you can go to our website and you can sign up for our newsletter. But that, that'll be the best way to make sure you get this information. All right, it looks like Paul has a question. All right. Any any more questions? Oh. I have a. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you have um, programs to which you want to give a portion of the administrative cost, um, you do it by budgeting the administrative cost separately and then applying. I mean. I'm just trying to think through. Would it be better for me to just put a percentage of the director's salary inside of each program and then not have an independent administrative budget, or is it better to have a separate administrative budget? Does the question yeah. make sense? I think so. So let me repeat the question make sure I got it. So um, for specific grants or specific programs, sometimes you're trying to figure out how to allocate people's salary who maybe work on that program but also do administrative things? Not only the salaries, but, you know, the cost, the office cost, the whatever. Yeah, if I yeah. want all the programs to have a portion of the administrative because they could not function without the administration, right? So you want mm. them to pay for part of the administration and to that be in their budget so when they know what they need to fundraise for their, you know, they take into account that part. So what is it? How, how do I do that? Do I put the salaries and the costs into the program budget, or do I keep an independent administrative budget? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So as an organization, mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep a separate administrative budget. So as an organization, you want to be able to show this these programs accounted for 80% of my activity, and my total admin was 20%. Okay. That said, a lot of grants will give you an acceptable admin percent, right? So um, we're going to allow you to, to spend 12% of this grant on administrative expenses. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a, it's a little bit more of a complicated question around um, if your program equals a grant, uh -huh. um, how we do that is a little different. Okay. Um, and, and I don't know, Mary, if you want to, it's, pro it's probably a 15-minute discussion um, on how best to do that. Yeah. But I, I think that you, you do want to have a separate organizational category that encompasses all of your administration. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's a good point. So. Our next webinar in November is around grant tracking. Yeah. Um, do you have a bunch of, are you referring specifically to grants, Anna? You know, not necessarily. I, um, we have been working with a group and they sort of um, prefer that, you know, administrative um, costs 
be associated to specific programs. So I was trying mm -hmm. how to figure that from the accounting perspective, but maybe it's just easier to do it how I've always done it, which is to keep a separate administrative. And then um, you can get, uh, how do you say that, uh, uh, a rate for which grants will accept that percentage and they don't need to know exactly the grant. But anyway, yeah. I, I see it may be just easier to do it as I've always done it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's good. Okay, so uh, one last question here. Um, I struggle with how much detail to give the board. Should I give actual versus budget and year to date uh, and last year or just the basic information? Um, you know, it depends on your board. It depends on your size. I think in general what you've described is pretty good, right? I give the actual versus the budget. Uh, a lot of times what we see people do is they'll do an actual versus budget for the current quarter and actual versus budget for the and an actual budget for the whole year. So they can sort of look at it two different ways. You know, I, I think my take on this is the more you show summary, the more different ways you can show summary level information, the better. Where I sort of where I sort of hold off on sharing stuff with the board is, you know, the breakdown between office expenses and postage and travel. You know, like, I, I don't want to get into those discussions, but I do want them to understand how we're doing for the quarter, how we're doing for the year, how we're doing this year versus last year. So the more different ways you can present summary information, I think, is good. So where I, where I get concerned with boards is when you're showing too much uh, line item detail, really. Thank you. So hopefully that answered your question, Paul. It did. I end up giving them a spreadsheet of just all this information because I think it might be useful in different places, and I'm not sure what they want, and I'm having trouble getting feedback from them. Yeah, yeah. That's um. Yeah, and if they're not giving you feedback, then I just yeah, it's really hard. But I, I would kind of um, you know, what you're doing is probably working. Um, because they would probably complain if it wasn't, is my guess. But, but I, I mean, I don't know your board. So okay, know. thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, a question from Candace. I just unmuted you, Candace. Um, okay, well, maybe we may have lost Candace here. Um, you are unmuted, Candace, so if we can't hear you, it's probably a, a microphone issue or something. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and close out. Everyone should have our email information, our phone number. You have our website. Um, there's a hundred different ways to get a hold of us. Feel free to just reach out with questions. We will have another webinar in November and another one in December that are scheduled. The next one will be grant tracking. It'll be a little more hands-on, a little more in-depth to go through um, exactly how grant tracking works and, and common pitfalls. Um, and then we'll really dive into financial reporting uh, in December. So look forward to hopefully hearing, seeing a lot of you back. And with that, we'll sign off. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.